just get the slides for you. Okay, um, so I'm a cognitive neuroscientist uh, and broadly I'm interested in the biology of well-being. And recently we've been conducting studies looking at how lifestyle such as sleep and our working lives can impact impulsivity and interception. This has included a project investigating how a four day working week can change mind, brain and body. And today I am going to talk a little bit about this project, but also some of our precursor work, looking at whether these different aspects of cognition can actually vary across the waking day, because that might have important implications for designing these kinds of intervention studies. Um, but Anna and, and the TUM team highlighted in this series, you're also interested in environmental sustainability. Um, so what I plan to cover is first explain what do we mean by these terms impulsivity and interception, then show our recent data on whether there might be some diurnal peaks and troughs in these domains of cognition. Then I'll talk about our four day working week study and how sleep might change when work patterns change. Then finally, I'll shift gears and broaden out to what our roles as researchers could be in terms of tackling the climate crisis and ecological emergency. And I'll show some of my lab's work looking at how we can reduce carbon emissions of MRI analysis uh, and also talk more broadly about the responsibilities that I think we have as researchers uh, to really act on this in our everyday working lives. OK, let's start by defining some of these terms. Uh, I suspect there are several of you from a psychology background here, but maybe also some who are perhaps more from a physiology background. So for those who aren't familiar with these terms, what do we mean by impulsivity? Well, it's quite multifaceted, but in a nutshell, impulsivity is a predisposition to rapid, often premature actions without appropriate foresight. This can be expressed in our everyday lives in quite a few ways, and we can measure it in the lab in quite a few ways, too. So for example, delayed discounting refers to how long are you willing to wait in order to obtain a larger reward? I suspect lots of us here would be willing to wait one month for a hundred pounds instead of having 10 pounds now, but we might be less inclined to wait six months. Secondly, you can look at risky choice. So are you more inclined to choose a smaller reward, but that's guaranteed or a larger reward, but that you might get only some of the time. And finally, we can also look at motor inhibition. So how able are you to stop a physical motor response when it's no longer appropriate? These facets of impulsivity do all share in common a broad neural basis in terms of interactions between prefrontal cortex and striatum. But there are some subtleties here in the specific anatomical segregation within those circuits. So motor impulsivity, for example, is particularly associated with the most lateral aspect of the striatum because that's the motor specialised segment of the basal ganglia. Uh, and these are the regions associated with performance of a stop signal task uh, during fMRI. Now, why might it be important to consider if impulsivity varies throughout the day? Well, think about how many times a day we need to rely on good motor impulsivity. Every time you cross the road, you need to be able to invoke that ability to stop if you suddenly see a car coming. We use it when cycling or driving too, uh, such as when you see a red stoplight or indeed you see a pedestrian kind of trying to cross the road. And we also need to use this reactive form of response inhibition in sport in so many aspects of our everyday lives. Um, so it could actually be quite dangerous if your impulsivity ability temporarily drops off due to circadian changes. Now, this question also has ramifications for us in terms of research methods, because let's say we're running an intervention study on the four day working week and we want to know if the neural networks underpinning response inhibition change on a four day week. And this is exactly what we have been doing then we might need to test participants at the time of day when they're usually worst in order to reduce ceiling effects and give us the maximum room for that intervention to have an effect. So there are impacts of these studies, both in terms of understanding the real world implications, as well as um, optimizing research methods. So in this work, which has been led by my PhD student, John McLaren, we set out to test whether motor impulsivity on the stop signal task can vary throughout the waking day. Now to do this, we use the stop signal task, a measure of motor response inhibition. And on this task, participants see a series of leftward and rightward pointing arrows indicating a button press. But then on a minority of trials, after a short variable delay, that arrow turns red and they also hear a beep. And this indicates they need to try and not press the button on those stop trials. 
And from this, we get a behavioral measure called the stop signal reaction time, which is basically an index of how well participants are able to stop when they receive that stop signal. We asked participants to do this task five times at these specific points in the day. And we chose these five times as occasions where there could be some strong implications of poor impulsivity, such as when commuting to work or whilst actually at work or whilst preparing food in the evening. And we also chose these times to have enough of a wide range of times whilst also not overburdening participants. Now, the psychologists amongst you might be worrying a little bit about practice effects, whereby if we asked all our participants to do the task first at 9 a.m. and then 20 p.m. last, then they might show better performance at 21 p.m. just due to it being the fifth time they've done it. So to control for this, we actually used five different test schedules and then we counterbalanced uh, that order across participants. So for some individuals, the 9 a.m. time slot was the first time they were doing it. But for some other individuals, the 21 p.m. time slot was the first time they were doing it. Now that meant that because for some participants we would need to spread testing across at least two days, we also standardized this across everyone so that everyone did one test per day over the week. Uh, that does mean that there's going to be likely some overnight consolidation happening, but that overnight consolidation is happening um, for all of those different schedule groups. So what did we find? Well, interestingly, it seems there's no significant differences between those five time points in stop signal reaction time, which is that key measure of motor inhibition on this task. And this is in a sample of 70 or so participants. So at least in this sort of sample size, we're not seeing particularly strong evidence of there being these diurnal fluctuations. Um, now that's interesting in and of itself, and also perhaps reassuring for those of us who are cycling, driving and, and walking about. Um, but it also suggests that we may not need to worry too much about what time of day we test participants in experiments using the stop signal task. Maybe if we tested a much larger sample, there might be some subtleties that came out here, but, but at least on this kind of sample size, we're not seeing very strong um, diurnal fluctuations. OK, now let's come on to interception, uh, which broadly is the signaling, central processing and neural and mental representation of internal bodily signals. Many of us will be familiar with the traditional five extraceptive senses of sight, sound, touch, smell and taste. But interception is sometimes described as the sixth sense and a sense that enables you to perceive bodily feelings such as how hard your heart's beating or how fast you're breathing. And we do know a little bit about the neural pathways that underpin interception, because we know that our visceral organs, like our heart, like our lungs, like our stomach, are actually embedded with nerves. And then signals can travel um, via ascending nerves to the brainstem and then onto the thalamus and then to the cortex. And in particular, those signals come in to the insular cortex of the brain. And in the posterior insula, we have actually a viscerotopic representation of signals from our internal bodily organs. So we have a heart area, we have a stomach area, and this is just like the somatotopic representation that we have of signals from the skin in the somatosensory cortex. These bodily signals in the posterior insula are then re-represented as you move anteriorly in the insula, so that by the time you get to the anterior end of the insula cortex, the activity here enables you to answer the question, how do I feel? Do I feel stressed? Do I feel tired? Do I feel upset? And it might be actually quite important to consider whether interception varies throughout the day because it's so relevant to a whole host of bodily behaviours, uh, such as ingestive behaviour, i.e. eating. But interception also underpins emotion and underpins our perception of bodily stress signals. So if your interceptive abilities and sensitivity is fluctuating throughout the day, that could have implications for whether you snack when you don't really need to, or maybe you being a little bit more vulnerable to an upsetting incident, or maybe whether you can notice bodily stress signals in time to do something about it. And as with impulsivity, beyond that interesting scientific research question, there are additional implications for research methods, like on a four day working week study where we're scanning an interception task, do we need to think about the time of day that we're testing participants to avoid ceiling or floor effects? So again, we have those kind of dual motivations here with this work of it being an interesting question per se, and then with the implication of how do we go about running intervention studies where we might be running these kinds of tasks. So how do we measure interception? 
Well, it isn't always straightforward because we need to measure participants' physiology, um, but there are some non-invasive ways to do this, such as by using um, a pulse oximeter device, um, which you can put on a participant's finger. And from this, we can measure their heartbeat whilst we ask them questions about what they can perceive about their own heartbeat. Historically, two common tasks that have been used are the heartbeat counting task, in which we ask participants to tell us how many heartbeats they counted during an interval. And then secondly, the heartbeat discrimination task, in which we ask participants to tell us whether a series of auditory tones are synchronous with their heartbeat or slightly asynchronous. Now, the field is quite in a bit of flux at the moment with considering what the best to task approaches could be. And in the interest of time, I won't get deep into that, but do ask me in the Q&A if you'd like to. What we did in our study is we looked back at a historical data set of over 1000 individuals who had completed these tasks with us in the lab pre-COVID. And from that, we could batch their data files into one of four time bins uh, shown here. And you'll notice that the afternoon and the evening time bins are slightly uneven. And that's because we didn't have a lot of people come through the lab after 17.30 p.m. So to get a bit more of a chunky sample size in that evening time bin, um, we shifted the boundary forward slightly. And now, of course, this is a downside of using historical data um, as opposed to acquiring fresh data where we get participants to do the task at specific times. But the flip side is um, we did have a, a large sample size, larger than we could get on a targeted uh, study. So pros and cons to these different approaches. Now, I'm not going to go through this big table in detail, but it's just to give you an overview of the 26 original studies that made up our overall sample, uh, over which we have um, over 1,200 participants. And you can see that we also have a mixture of patient groups and comparison groups. And by patient, I mean someone with a mental health diagnosis or potentially a neurodiversity status or both. Also, you can see that some studies had more data than others. So pretty much everyone did the heartbeat counting task and most did the heartbeat discrimination task. We also calculated trait interceptive prediction error, that's type, um, for the participants in whom we had body perception questionnaire data. And what we do is we take the scores on the body perception questionnaire to be an index of trait level sensitivity to bodily sensations. What we can do is then compare that to the participants' accuracy scores on the heartbeat perception task. And from this, we can see how well they align. So if there's a mismatch, it might be that the participant says they're sensitive to bodily sensations in everyday life, but they're not so accurate on perceptual tasks. So they're maybe more sensitive to signals that are perceived a bit more noisily. So what do we find? Well, first on the heartbeat counting task, when we look at the two groups separately of comparisons or patients, we don't see any significant time of day effects. But when we pull all 1,200 together, we start to see some quite subtle but significant effects emerging. So people are slightly less accurate in the morning compared to midday, and they're also slightly less accurate compared to the evening. People are also slightly less accurate in the afternoon relative to the evening as well. So we sort of uh, see these, these peaks and troughs um, with better performance midday and then better again in the evening. But we do need to pull all 1,200 together to see this. What about on the heartbeat discrimination task? Well, here we don't see any significant diurnal changes in either comparison or patient groups. And when we add them together for the larger sample size, it looks like there could perhaps be a slight trend to that very slight bump in performance um, in midday and in the evening, um, but it's not statistically significant. And if we're looking at 1,200 people, um, that's probably relatively strong. Um, although we do have to bear in mind, of course, the limitation for this study relative to the stop signal one is these are actually different people in these different time bins. Now, what happens when we come to look at interceptive prediction error? So remember, this is the mismatch between objective accuracy on heartbeat perception tasks and subjective sensibility on self-report questionnaires. We can see in the comparison group that the prediction error is slightly higher in the morning relative both to midday and to the afternoon. 
Then when we come to look at the patient group, uh, it's also highest in the morning uh, and then significantly decreases relative to the morning, both uh, in midday and evening. And then when we pull the sample together, we can see that again, interceptive prediction error is highest in the morning um, and then lowest at midday uh, and numerically uh, and significantly lowest in the evening. Now, of course, this somewhat mirrors the heartbeat counting accuracy diurnal dips because that's half of the data um, going into these calculations. What about on the discrimination task? Here, um, again, mirroring the accuracy data, we see no diurnal dips in interceptive prediction error when calculated using the heartbeat discrimination accuracy instead. So that tells us that perhaps there are some fluctuations in interception, but it's task dependent. Uh, and again, lots of discussion in the literature at the moment on what aspects of interceptive experiences uh, these different tasks are actually dipping into. We did also check whether there was an interaction between diurnal effects and group status. And looking just at uh, the heartbeat counting and accuracy prediction error data, we do see significant main effects. So there are overall diurnal changes and there are overall effects of being a patient or comparison participant, um, whereby um, accuracy is typically higher in the comparison groups but there's no significant interaction. So what that means is diurnal rhythms and interception don't differ if you're a patient, um, which is interesting. So in summary, there are some diurnal fluctuations on some tasks, but it's not across the board. Um, so we do need to be aware of the implications of the different task approaches. Overall, there's not um, incredibly strong, overwhelming data um, that these aspects of cognition wildly fluctuate um, across the day. Uh, and this has been really useful, both in terms of uh, interesting scientific questions, but also in terms of the research methods, because this has helped us in setting up our four day working week study. And in the end, we decided not to bother testing participants at specific times of day um, because those preceding results weren't overly compelling in terms of very strong fluctuations. And this also helped with feasibility when testing working adults in the general population who are sometimes a bit limited around their work of when they can come in for MRI brain scanning. So now I'm going to move on to talking about some of our four day working week um, data. And this project is very much still ongoing. Uh, I'm going to give you some snapshots into some highlights so far, um, but hopefully I can come back in a, a while, in a year or down the line and give you some of our updated info. So firstly, what do we mean by this phrase, this concept of four day week? Well, in a nutshell, we're talking about full time employees reducing time at work to four days, but with no loss of salary. They keep their full time salary. In general, we're also not talking about working for very long days. So under the current implementation of a four day week, there should be some overall reduction in the number of hours spent at work over the course of that week. And that probably sounds like a pretty good deal from an employee's perspective. And indeed, there's increasing interests in the potential benefits that this could have, firstly, to workers in terms of better work-life balance. But there are many other potential interesting implications and benefits too. So for employers in having a better rested workforce who are really firing on all cylinders when they do come into work. And you may have heard some of the media headlines about improved productivity on a four day working week. I know that Germany is one of the leaders in this uh, in Europe and around the world. There are also implications for society of that improved productivity, also in terms of gender equality and even potential environmental benefits, too, from taking a fifth of the cars off the road each day uh, of people commuting. And the data supporting these benefits is steadily growing. There are many trials around the world now that have happened or are in progress, and many of these have been led by uh, the Four Day Week Global Foundation. And one of these national scale trials ran here in the UK last year. Now, I'm not going to read you all of these changes in terms of benefits for individual staff health and well-being. But just reading through this, you can see some pretty impressive benefits that are on offer for the individual staff themselves. The employers also vote with their feet too, because in the UK national trial, 92% chose to continue with the four day week longer term after the trial period. So it's popular with employees, but it's also popular with employers too. 
They also see some impressive results in terms of reductions um, in staff leaving um, and also in terms of productivity, whether that's self-rated or um, internal company metrics as well. But why is it the case that a four day week can be effective in both improving well-being and performance in the workplace as well? We still don't know exactly why, I'm hoping to find out, but we've got some hints already in that employers tell us about feeling better rested and feeling more motivated. And as sleep specialists, I think everyone here today will know that being stressed and not getting enough rest really does affect us. It affects us psychologically in mind, it affects us neurally in the brain, and it affects us physio physiologically in the body as well. We're human. <laughs> So I think it's the human factor um, that's behind those improvements. And I think what's going on is that the effects of the four day week on workplace performance might be explained, at least in part, by improvements to well-being. And where do those well-being improvements come from on workplace performance? Well, in part, they're going to come from the brain. So this is what's led us to set up the Sussex four day week study to try and take a much deeper dive into the psychological and the biological changes that are taking place for employees and really draw out some of the mechanisms of what these causal changes might be that you're hearing about in the media. We're taking lots of types of data uh, from occupational psychology and wellbeing questionnaires to a time use diary and a sleep watch and all of this is conducted remotely at home. Um, and then for those employees who are up for visiting us on the University of Sussex campus, we run MRI brain scans to look at uh, how brain structure and function might change on a four day week, a blood sample to look at immune system function and the interception heartbeat perception tasks that I mentioned earlier. And we do this over a period of many weeks. So we start with a couple of baseline weeks. This is when staff are still working five days. And then they drop down to four days a week and continue that for a period of 12 weeks. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on the results that we've seen so far from the weekly questionnaire battery. So what do we see? What I'm showing you in these graphs, the first two uh, bars are um, the baseline sessions when staff are still working five days. And the green line here is the point at which staff um, switch uh, to the four day week and then they continue that for 12 weeks. We can see if we look at mood, firstly, negative emotions, as soon as staff switch, negative emotions start decreasing. Um, but there's a cumulative benefit such that the longer participants have been on the four day week, the better and better they're feeling. We can see the reverse for positive emotions. So as soon as they switch, we start to get a little bit of a bump and then it continues to grow and to build throughout the trial. Now let's look at. Um, at uh, sleep quality and psychological detachment. So this is a single item measure asking participants to rate their sleep quality um, as either fairly good, um, very good, fairly good, fairly bad, or very bad. And note that this is reverse scored. So um, lower scores indicate better sleep here. Now you can see the data a little bit noisy. We've since doubled our sample size. And um, so this is looking a little bit cleaner with a larger sample. Um, but when we take the average of the two baseline sessions and the average of the four day week period, we do see a statistically significant improvement in sleep quality on the four day week. Now, quite allied to that is this concept of psychological detachment. So what I mean by psychological detachment is how easy do you find it uh, to switch off from work at the end of the working day? And if you're not very high in psychological detachment, if you're going into the evening period still thinking about maybe even worrying about work, we know that that can filter through to impacting sleep quality, insomnia, people waking up in the middle of the night because of that nighttime work rumination. So... Uh, it's uh, good to see here that increase in psychological detachment as uh, employees are progressing through the trial. What does that mean in terms of how participants feel about work? So this is burnout. This is the Maslach Burnout Inventory Emotional Exhaustion Subscale. Um, this mirrors the negative emotion finding whereby as soon as staff switch, this starts to get better and then it mostly improves throughout the rest of the trial. 
By work engagement, we mean how enthusiastic and motivated you feel about work. Now, interestingly, it's a, a fair few weeks before this starts to climb. It's more in the latter half of the trial um, where we see this increasing. And I think that might be in part due to the journey that staff are going on with adapting their working routines, because it does take a good few weeks for some uh, new good habits to form of, of maximizing um, efficiency and productivity. So speaking of productivity, uh, we measure this in a couple of ways. The first is by asking participants at the beginning of each week to set themselves five goals for the coming week ahead. And then at the end of the week, we ask them to reflect back and tell us how well they feel they met their five goals. And one of the nice things about this uh, measure is that it can cut across all sorts of different job roles, even within the same organization. Uh, so some work goals for me might be prepare my TUM talk. <laughs> It might be prepare the agenda um, for my sustainability meeting next week, these sorts of jobs, but you can tailor this to the nature of the work that you're doing. So what we see here is that as soon as staff switch to the four day week, this jumps up 10% and then they manage to maintain that high level of performance throughout the rest of the trial. So in 12 weeks anyway, there doesn't seem to be a kind of drop off of a honeymoon period. The second way we measure productivity is with a task performance questionnaire, which essentially asks, how well do you feel you met the duties of your job description this week? And again, note that this is reverse scored, so lower scores indicate better task performance. This mirrors quite closely the goal attainment in that as soon as staff switch, it improves about 10% and then they maintain that good level of performance. Um, so the summary so far is that we're seeing mood improves, burnout improves, sleep quality improves, people feel better able to switch off from work at the end of the working week. And in terms of self-reported productivity, that seems to get a boost from the four day week. You may be thinking, hmm, is there not a little bit of an incentive <laughs> to report better productivity during the four day week period? And um, one way that we approach this is we do take some control questionnaire measures that we would not expect a four day week to change because they're stable features of the organization or stable personality characteristics. And if staff were, whether consciously or unconsciously, setting out to game the questionnaires, then they might be inclined to answer those questionnaires in a more positive um, manner. But reassuringly, those control questionnaire measures are pretty static. So we think that this is a reflection of how staff are, are genuinely feeling. But of course, it's also very useful to take some objective measures too, and that's where some of our more biological data comes in. Now, partly why I wanted to give you this in-depth view on what we've seen on the questionnaires is in relation to this analysis. What I did was I calculated the difference in sleep, mood, productivity and work engagement between the baseline period and the four day week period. I then tested for correlations between those changes. And interestingly, we're seeing that the amount that your sleep improves correlates with the amount that your productivity improves. So the more your subjective sleep quality improves, the more your productivity goes up when you switch to the four day week. On the flip side, the more that your mood improves, the more your work engagement improves. And we did not see an association between sleep and work engagement, and we did not see an association between mood and productivity. So for me, this is some early tentative evidence that we might be looking at two different mechanisms in play here in terms of consequences for work performance. It could be that better sleep is improving function of the prefrontal cortex, and that's what leads to better productivity. Whilst on the other hand, it might be that better mood changes insular cortex activity. And that might lead to more enthusiasm and motivation for work. And remember, this is the region of the brain, one region that's really important for impulsivity, for staying focused. And this is a region of the brain that's really important for perception of bodily stress signals and for mental health. Now, at this point, we're very much still underway with data collection. Um, so come back to me um, in a year's time to see if we've managed to confirm those hypotheses. But for now, um, it's some really exciting early data um, that there's some interesting sleep changes taking place on the four day week. Okay, now in the final section of the talk, I want to move on to environmental sustainability, because wonderful as all of that neuroscience is, wonderful as all those well-being insights are, there's no science on a dead planet. And we really should worry about this. 
we're already seeing catastrophic effects on our own local areas. And we know that human society is fragile. We've seen just how disrupted our economies have been in the UK, I know in Germany as well, by a war in Europe so far on just one country. Think what climate change could do in Germany, in the UK, in Europe. Um, in the UK already, we are having people die from climate change because um, recently, just the last couple of weeks, we've had floods and three people have died as a result of that flooding. And we should care about this on a personal level, morally, um, and because we are all now in danger. I'm in danger here in the UK. Even in the global north, we are now in danger. But I'd like to argue we should particularly care as professional scientists. And that's for a number of reasons. Think how disrupted our lab work was by COVID. That is nothing compared to the disruption that we might face from mounting extreme weather events that disrupt energy supply, that disrupt societal infrastructure. We also have to face the fact that our scientific research has environmental impacts, and we do need to take responsibility for our own scientific environmental footprints. Furthermore, as professional scientists, we're in a position to do something, and we're in a great position to be ambassadors on this, and we should be ambassadors on this, because if professional scientists can't put their own house in order when it comes to tackling the footprint of our work activities, then how could we expect the general public to take action on this as well? And in fact, the answer is relatively simple. We know what we need to do. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change tell us we need to take rapid and drastic action across all sections of society, and that includes scientific research. Last year, we suggested five main domains in which scientists could act, and I'm not going to detail every single one of these in the interest of time, but I would like to talk briefly about the work that my postdoc, Nick Souter, has been leading on how to compute more carefully within neuroscience research. And to introduce this, Nick uses this nice example from machine learning to classify crop pests visually. Because if you look at how much data is actually needed to get good performance in a machine learning analysis like this, you can see a plateau here, such that once you use about 50% of the maximum possible available data, you actually get very good and very similar performance to when you use 100% of the available data. So do we really need to use all that extra resource of the additional 50% of data for what is really a bit of a non-meaningful, tiny increase in training accuracy? Probably not. Just think about all the additional resource that's required in the collection of that data, but also in the computation of training a model on double the amount of data too. Now we've been applying this principle to measure the carbon footprint of MRI brain scan analysis. And to do that, we need a way to measure the energy expenditure of that analysis. Because bear in mind, every time we press go on an analysis, that is using energy. And this is particularly the case if you're running data intensive processes, uh, perhaps on a high performance cluster or institutional server. And this is usually the case when we're analyzing MRI brain scans. And there are various approaches to carbon tracking um, the energy that's being used. And I won't detail all of these, but do ask me in the Q&A if you're interested. Essentially, what all of these do is they work by measuring the energy expenditure along with the carbon intensity of the geographical location where the server is. Because some countries have high renewables versus fossil fuels than others. So if you're running your analysis um, in a country with high renewables relative to fossil fuels, you'll have lower carbon intensity for the same amount of, of energy used compared to if you ran that same analysis and use that same uh, energy in a country that had higher fossil fuels uh, relative to renewables. So, so these are the uh, two key components that go into carbon tracking of uh, your computing. Now, using carbon trackers, we've been investigating the impact of only running the pre-processing steps that you really need. So this is akin to the crop pests machine learning example. And for more on other ways that we can save carbon as human brain images, then do you see uh, Nick's preprint here? Uh, but today I'm going to focus in particularly on this step here, um, on the results from Nick's study, looking at how we can identify that sweet spot in the plateau of good performance, but reduced energy usage.
And for you, those of you who aren't human brain images, this is just to illustrate that in processing MRI brain scan data, there are actually many, many individual steps that need to be performed, um, which can be quite time consuming and certainly does consume a, a lot of energy uh, in the analysis, especially when you stack up many uh, participants uh, across the data set. And today in human brain imaging, the combinatorial explosion of the number of settings you could use in analyzing MRI brain scan data is really quite high. Uh, and this is just one example of the fMRI pre-processing tool, fMRI prep. fMRI prep has a series of default settings, but it also has quite a lot of flexibility in how you can use it by switching flags on and off. So we identified a, a set of um, baseline analysis settings, which are basically all the default settings of fMRI prep. And then we identified nine alternative pipelines with slightly different settings. And some of these might increase performance, but also increase compute and thereby carbon. Some of these alternative settings might decrease carbon, great, but at the expense of performance. And what we want to do is to find the sweet spot where we get good performance of fMRI prep, but with reduced energy and thereby reduced carbon emissions. To measure performance, we essentially look at the height of statistical task activation on a stop signal task of response inhibition in two key regions. This is the primary motor cortex, which is associated with pressing a button, and the pre-supplementary motor area, which is involved in the cognitive effort um, to try and withhold a button press. And we know from the wider stop signal literature, these are two key regions for response inhibition. So um, as a brain imager, we're looking to see that we are sensitive um, to activations in these regions but can we do it in a way that we also save a bit of carbon? So here are our results. Now the baseline pipeline, which has the default fMRI settings is in the middle here um, because it had the middle amount um, of carbon and carbon is plotted with the dotted green line um, in relation to this scale here. And then the pink and purple lines here are the statistical activation in these two regions of interest in relation to um, this scale here. Now, what we can see already is that applying different settings from the defaults can potentially save us really quite a lot of carbon. So if we look at pipeline one here, this saves almost 50% of the carbon relative to the default settings. And happily, if you look at what happens in terms of end performance, there is no decrease in performance uh, in terms of what we care about as human brain images relative to the baseline. And what this uh, pre-processing pipeline actually does is it switches off um, a default setting to project the end data into what's known as surface space. So projecting our statistical um, heat map results onto a flat brain map instead of a volumetric um, brain template. Um, and if you're only planning to run your statistical analysis in volumetric space, you do not need that surface map reconstruction. It's an unnecessary step. So switch it off, you don't need it. Then we can see some other settings whereby carbon is saved, but pre-processing is affected. So here we probably wouldn't recommend that as a step towards saving carbon um, because it has that knock on um, scientific impact in terms of quality of the insights. So I'm not gonna go through every single um, one of these results, um, but we will be putting a preprint up um, in probably a couple of weeks time. So do get in touch um, down the line uh, if you would like that preprint. Uh, and that preprint contains um, this list of seven actions. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these in the interest of time, but we hope that these will be some nice, easy wins that can help neuroimagers reduce uh, energy use in their analysis when using the fMRI prep tool. Now, as I come to the end and wrap up, I'd like to briefly comment on the fact that sometimes colleagues say, oh, but what we do as individual scientists doesn't matter, it's up to governments, they need to sort this crisis out. And yes, we urgently need governments to legislate, but they do not have a clue about our work. They haven't got a clue that our MRI brain scan analyses are burning fossil fuels. The people who have the deepest insight into our work and who are therefore best placed to tackle its footprint, that's us. Those of us who are actually doing the research, those of us who are using that energy, it's up to us because the government, even scientific funders, don't understand our work as well as we do. 
I'd also like to emphasize that in taking action in our own scientific lives, I think it has a really important effect on social norms. Because when we take action in our own work, it influences what goes on at other levels. It creates a social mandate for change. When we see others taking action, it makes you think, oh, I should be doing that too, because it's becoming a social norm that we all lean into this. So if there's one thing you do as a result of this webinar, and actually I think this is the most important thing to do, it's to talk about it. Talk about it with your colleagues, talk about it in your lab meetings, talk about it at departmental meetings, talk about it in your academic societies, because that is how individual actions percolate and that is how we can change society. And that's what we're doing here today in you scheduling a talk series that features environmental sustainability. It's socially norms that this is important, that we talk about it and that we want to do something about it. So I'd like to end by thanking collaborators on both the well-being and the sustainability work. And thank you for your attention. And I'm looking forward to the questions. <laughs>